So, let's assume we have a set G and a binary operation defined on G, we'll call it star. Now, as a tacit assumption, but not one of the explicit axioms of a group, we have that for every two elements, call them A and B, in the set G, that A star B is both defined and it is equal to another element in G. This is what we call closure under the binary operation star. All right, so I'm going to denote the set G, the binary operation star, and the fact that it's closed under this operation. I'm going to use this notation right now to mean that, to consider all that together. And then we're going to say that this set together with the operation is a group if it satisfies three properties. So the first property. For every A, B, and C elements of the set G, A star B star C is equal to A star B star C. This is the associative property of what we're going to say multiplication. Our operation need not be normal multiplication, but we call it a multiplication. So, we want associative associativity of the binary operation. That's property one. Property two. There exists an element, we'll call it E, in the set G, such that for every A in G, A star E is E star A is just A. This element E is going to be like multiplying by the number 1 or adding the number 0, right? It's going to be an identity element. We're going to assume that G has such an identity. Property 2. Property 3. For every element A in G, there exists an element A inverse in G such that A star A inverse is equal to the identity element or A, star in, or A, A inverse star A is equal to that identity, identity element. We need both of these to hold. This is the inverse property. We have inverses for our elements. If a set G closed under a binary operation star satisfies all three of these properties, then we call G a group. All right, first off, we're going to shorten this A star B to just AB. We talk about it as though it were multiplication. It's just because this is much easier to write and read than this. So the first important property we want to consider is that of cancellation. So we want to show that for all A, B, and C in a group G, if A, B is equal to A, C, then we can cancel on the left so that B is equal to C. Likewise, if BA is equal to CA, we want to have right cancellation so that we can conclude B is equal to C. This may seem extremely elementary, but we're not talking about just real numbers here where we can just divide so long as A is not zero, right? We have to prove that this property holds for any group. So proof. We know that there exists an element by the uh, third axiom. There exists an element A inverse in G such that A A inverse is equal to A inverse A is equal to the identity E. Now, 
This means that if we multiply this equation on the left by the element a inverse, both sides still have to be equal since we're doing the same thing to both sides. So that a inverse times a times b is equal to a inverse times a times c. Well, now we also have by property one, associativity of multiplication, our binary operation star. So that we can rewrite this as a inverse a times b has to be equal to a inverse a times c. But by definition of the inverses, right, a inverse a as well as a a inverse is going to be equal to just the identity e. So this means that e times b is equal to e times c. Now once again by the second property, which is the existence of an identity element, we know that the identity element times some other element, b, is always going to be equal to b. Likewise, e times c must always be equal to c. Thus, we have b is equal to c. And left cancellation is proven. Like, like, likewise, we're going to do the exact same thing to prove right cancellation, right? We're going to multiply on the right by a inverse so that we have b a inverse, or b a, sorry, a inverse equals c a a inverse. By associativity, this is b a a inverse equals c a a inverse. So b e is equal to c e, and therefore b is equal to c. So we have our proof is done. We have left and right cancellation holding in any group G. All right, the next important property is that our identity element is unique. So how do we show this? Well, suppose that we have two elements which are both identity elements. So uh, suppose that E1 and E2 are two elements in G such that E1 times A equals A times E1 equals A and E2 times A is equal to A times E2 is equal to A for all elements A in the group G. Now by transitivity of the equal sign, in other words, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C, then because these expressions are both equal to A, say, we can say that if we look at this one, A E1 has to be equal to A E2, right? Because they're both equal to A, but we just proved that we can cancel on the left by A, so the E1 must be equal to E2. And since this is true for any such two elements, we must have that all such elements are really just the one identity, and the identity is thus unique in the group G. All right, along the same lines of thinking, let's prove the uniqueness of each inverse element. That is to say, because each element in the group G has an inverse, let's prove that there's only one such inverse. So if there exists uh, these elements such that A1 inverse times A is equal to A times A1 inverse equals the identity E, and we have likewise A2 inverse times A is equal to a times A2 inverse is equal to the identity element. Then once again, because these are both equal to E, we can pick whichever pair we want. Again, I'll pick this pair and set them equal to each other. This means that A, A1 inverse is equal to A, A2 inverse. We have left cancellation holding in a group, so that must mean that these two are equal. Because this is true for any arbitrary pair of inverses, we must have that there is only one such inverse element, and thus inverses are unique in the group G.
Next thing is, what's the inverse of a product? Well, we claim that it's the product of their reversed order inverses. So AB inverse is equal to B inverse times A inverse. Let's show this. Suppose we have A, B elements in G. For all elements, this means for all, for all elements in the group G, we have AB times B inverse times A inverse is equal to what? Well, uh, where we're defining it like this. Well, because of associativity, this is equal to A times B, B inverse times A inverse, right? Where, uh, suppose we have some implicit parentheses there. Then, this must be equal to, by the definition of an inverse, A times E times A inverse. But A times E is just equal to A, so we have A times A inverse, and this is just equal to the identity E. Thus, B inverse times A inverse is the inverse, at least one-sided inverse, of A times B. Let's look at the other side. Can we show that this is also equal to the identity? Well, yes we can. This is going to be equal to, by associativity, B inverse times A inverse A times B is going to be equal to, likewise, B inverse E times B is going to be equal to just B inverse times B is going to be equal to the identity. Thus, this is both the left inverse and the right inverse of the element A times B. So, by definition then, it is the inverse of AB. And by our previous theorem, inverses are unique, so B inverse times A inverse is the unique inverse of the element A times B in G. So now let's show that the inverse of the inverse of an element is just that element. Alright, so by the definition of A inverse, we have that A inverse times A is equal to A times A inverse is equal to the identity element, right? But by the definition of A inverse inverse, we also have there exists some B in the group G such that A inverse times uh, B is equal to B times A inverse is equal to the identity element E, right? And to where B is equal to A inverse inverse, right? Well, because these are both equal to the identity, we can set them equal to each other, and then we get A A inverse is equal to B A inverse. We cancel on the right and we get that A is equal to B. Because we know that B is by definition the inverse of the inverse, <clears throat> then we know that A is equal to the inverse of the inverse of A. QED. All right, I'm going to state another theorem without proof this time, and it's going to be the generalized associative law. What do I mean by generalized? So we have that in a group G, AB times C is equal to A times BC for all A, B, and C in the group G. Right? This is one of our three axioms of a group. <clears throat> However, what about more complicated expressions like uh, <clears throat> A1 times... Uh, B, C times uh, A2, A3, F, <laughs> I'm just picking random letters, uh, and then we have some kind of complicated uh, uh, parentheses structure. How do we know that this is equal to uh, any arrangement of those parentheses differently that still keeps these elements left to right in this order? Well, that's a statement of the generalized associative law, that if this is true, then this has to be equal to any other rearrangement of those parentheses, right? And I'm not going to give the proof of this, but the idea is to do it inductively. 
So suppose that it's uh, true for a small case and then build up larger cases, so more parentheses and more complicated expressions from that. And then we define what you might call a meaningful product uh, of elements just a times b times c in terms of this generalized associative law. This, this expression, a, b, c, d, or e, f, whatever, however many you want, is well defined and the reason it's well defined is because it doesn't matter where you put the parentheses in, the generalized associative law says that as long as these are elements of a group G, then the generalized associative law holds, so it's true for any order of parentheses. This isn't true of all things, but it's true of groups. So that we don't even have to put the parentheses at all, because we know that it's the same no matter how we put them in. All right, the next important property is that if we have an equation ax equals b or an equation ya equals b, for any elements a and b in the group g, there must exist unique x and unique y, although they need not be the same, uh, such that those two equations are satisfied. So not only do solutions always exist, but they are always unique. How do we show this? Well, there's only going to be a unique element, a inverse, say, for the first equation, uh, which is going to cancel on the left with a. So we're going to have ax equals b, and we're solving for x given a and b in the group g. So we want to multiply the whole thing on the left by a inverse. So we have a inverse ax is equal to a inverse b. Notice that a inverse is the unique element of g, such that a inverse a is going to be equal to the identity, and thus we're going to get x on the left side, so that we have ex is equal to a inverse b, or just x is equal to a inverse b. This is our unique solution in the group G. Because the group G is closed under operations, or under the, the binary operation star, as we called it earlier, uh, a inverse star b is going to be another element of G. So this is a unique element in the group G. Likewise, with the other equation, if we had ya is equal to b, we could multiply both sides on the right by a inverse and get ya a inverse is equal to b a inverse. Where again, I don't have to put in those parentheses because the generalized associative law holds. And so this becomes ye is equal to b a inverse or just y is equal to b a inverse. And this is a unique element which is once again in the group G. And this is a unique element that is in the group G, B times A inverse, because G is closed with respect to the operation star. All right, there's a special type of group which I'd like to mention, and that is an abelian group. So an abelian group is just a group, uh, a group with, with an operation such that for all elements in the group, let's call them A and B, for all A, B, and G, we have A star B is equal to B star A. You should already know this as the commutative property. Commutative property of, say, multiplication or addition. Well, we're at the moment we're calling it multiplication, uh, <clears throat> but whenever the commutative property holds, we tend to think of the group operation as sort of an, an addition operation because addition is always commutative. So that we have, uh, we often write a plus b equals b plus a, even if we're not talking about adding numbers like we normally do. We call this an additive group or an abelian group. And in an abelian group, the generalized commutative law holds, just as for a general group, the generalized associative law holds. And the idea of the generalized commutative law is just that if we have some product, a1, a2, all the way up to ak, in, uh, where, where all these elements are elements of the group G, the abelian group G, then we know that this is going to be equal to a2 times a1 times a3 all the way to ak or a uh, a 
You can switch these two elements now, A2, A3, A1, to AK, or really any order you want. So A5, A7, A1, A2, you know, AK. So that we can switch any two elements because AB is equal to BA, right? So we can always we can always sort of put parentheses around two elements and say, well, this is equal to the reverse order. And it's still going to be the same product. Now this is only true in abelian groups because we have the commutative property. And of course, uh, you can prove this in sort of an inductive way, just like with the generalized associative law, but I won't do that here.